One of the most common things being said about this campaign is it's unlike any other. Well, few people have covered campaigns from both the inside and the outside. The new, is this really different? It's been unconventional and radical in every way. I've, I've covered campaigns for 30 years and nothing, there's not even a close second. You know, we, we looked at this race a couple of years ago and we said X, Y, and Z was likely to happen. And not only did that not happen, it was a whole different alphabet. You know, it was like Greek, Russian. And Russian's probably more appropriate for this election. You know, one of the, the pillars of a, a good democracy is the election process. Yeah. Has this process been good for democracy? I think it's been good in the sense that it has given voice to anger in the country. And that's what a good democracy does. I mean, it, it, it allows people to amplify their voices and feel like they have a say. And, that, and they're doing that because they felt like they haven't for a long time. The disturbing part of this election is what's happened in the last month or so when you had Donald Trump talking about, you know, it was unclear whether or not he'd even sort of certify the election results depending on the outcome. That's problematic for democracy and not good. I would like to promise and pledge that I will totally accept the results of this great and historic presidential election if I win. What's been problematic for our country in the last decade or so is that there hasn't been a real mandate for a president. In other words, when George W. Bush, my old boss, ran, we had the recount. So half the country thought that was that Bush wasn't a legitimate president. Then you had Obama. And you had the whole birther issue, which, of course, Donald Trump was largely responsible for. So you had a bunch of people in the country thinking he was, you know, a foreign-born, uh, you know, non-legitimate uh, president. And now, if depending on the outcome of here, if, if Donald Trump continues the sort of behavior that he is, it's likely we're going to have another situation where we have much of the country not believing in a legitimate outcome of the election. You know, you could make that argument now, given the last few days of the campaign. Yeah. Either way. Well, the loser is going to say this wasn't fair. That's the problem. In fact, you know, as crazy and difficult and depressing as this election has been, it looks maybe even bleaker afterwards. Because, because you're right. No matter how this turns out, half the country is going to be pissed off. Can we say pissed off on your? <laughs> sure, it's Canada. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we get pissed off too. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be very angry. I mean. I think the scariest moment, in uh, many ways, has been the last week with the FBI director coming out with a whole new revelation 10 days before the election. That, that's, that's destabilizing this whole process and giving everybody pause about the outcome of, of the election. Some of you may have heard about a letter that the FBI director uh, sent out yesterday. It is pretty strange. It's pretty strange to put something like that out with such little information right before an election. Did he have a choice? No, I think he was completely rock and hard place. If he'd waited until after the election, imagine what the response then would have been from Republicans who said, wait a minute, you had information, you were sitting on it. That would have been much worse than an already bad situation. I want to show a couple of clips from the circus. Before I do, I, I, I mean, one of the, the beauties of this program of yours and, and John and Mark's is that You've had access. You've gotten kind of inside the game or the circus. Um, how hard was that to get the parties to agree to do that? It was hard. Uh, camp I mean, it used to be my job in campaigns to keep people like me out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I get it. Uh, but things have changed because voters, voters are really hungry for authenticity. And I had seen the inside of campaigns for many, many years. And there's so much that goes on that I think is A, interesting, B, entertaining, compelling, and important for voters to know. I think people just get a better understanding of the candidates and the people around them, their families. It just more context for these people that were electing to run the free world. And so that was the idea behind it. But we had to work it hard. It was the worst part of this, is like begging everybody every week, please, 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 let yeah. us in, let us in. One of the challenges of getting access is whether or not you're getting real access. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's, there's an argument that even when you do get access, they know there's a camera there, right? Mm. But what I found is that they know there's a camera there for about 15 seconds, and then they forget. All right, let me show you the two clips. The first one is uh, happened just after Labor Day uh, with the Clinton crowd, and this is you um, going on the plane. Yeah. 6 a.m. White Plains, New York, Labor Day. 60 days left, it's a sprint to the finish. 
This race has tightened up. This could go either way. Today, Secretary Clinton is on a larger plane, a charter plane, with the press for the first time. This is a big damn deal. Are you? <laughs> this is it. So we've just landed in Cleveland, and 100 yards to my right here is Hillary's plane. 200 yards that way is Trump's plane. One of them is you can, you, can, you could run that almost any time in the campaign because every time she seems to get a little bit of a lead, yeah. then suddenly it, it, it starts to tighten up. But tell me, when, when you look at that, what, or being a part of that day, what are you seeing that we're not seeing? Uh, a lot of things. I mean, it was significant because it was the first day that Hillary Clinton let the press on the plane. She's been famously, you know, she'd gone 270 days without a press conference, no interaction with the press, completely sealed off. And so this was the first Does time. Does she not trust the media? What, what is it about it's, her and it's the press? 30, it's, it's decades of being in the trenches and being in highly partisan warfare with Republicans and just, you know, uh, having been burned a lot, uh, having been scorched. And it's just her inclination to be cautious uh, and her style. Although, a couple things about when she came out on the plane. One is that you realize that she's a total pro. I mean, she knocked down 20, 30 questions, no problem. I mean, she... <laughs> You know, she can do that better than anybody that I've seen in politics in terms of anticipating what a question is. There's not a lot she doesn't know or hasn't thought about. So she, she knocked down those questions. You know, it was like batting practice, no problem. But <laughs> The other thing I, I, I noticed was that um, she saw you. Yeah. She pointed you out. Yeah. Saw the hat. Well, th so th here's another thing. So she hadn't been out in front of the press corps in, you know, months and months and months and months. And what happened there, I'm sure, is that she saw a sea of press, you know, mostly hostile, and she saw my hat, and that was just a familiar face. I know her from some nonprofit work, and it was just a familiar face where she was like, it was kind of like a lifeline. It's like, oh, there's somebody, you know. Let me show you the Trump clip. This is interesting, too. They're all interesting. <laughs> I'm in Florida. Why is Florida important? Well, it's the third biggest state in the country. When we win it, it pretty well locks up another president's right. But today we have some very serious matters to discuss. There have been Islamic terrorist attacks in Minnesota and New York City and in New Jersey. Yet Hillary Clinton talks tougher about my supporters than she does about Islamic terrorists, right? Hillary Clinton is a weak ineffective person and I will tell you if you choose Donald Trump these problems are going to go away far far greater than anybody would think believe me thank you God bless you thank you God bless you so what um, what are you seeing there that we aren't seeing on this one well, I was struck by this rally as I was the very first time I went to a Trump rally and it struck every time I went to one, which is they're not like any p political events I've ever seen before. They really are like a rock concert, a church revival. You really get a sense that it's a movement and something different. I can't recall a candidate 
in the U.S. or anywhere else, including Canada, being able to get away with, on a consistent basis, and he's done it for a couple of years now, of getting up and saying whatever the problem is, whether it's, you know, whether it's terrorism, whether it's the economy, you know, whatever it is, saying, if you like me, that's not going to be a problem anymore. Yeah. Never yeah. explain how, why it won't be a problem. He just says it. It's, re it's remarkable. I mean, you know, and again, that's kind of why everybody initially said, oh, this isn't going to go away very far, because he just says, you know, we're going to build a wall. How? You know, I'll tell you later. <laughs> but people are so hungry for something different uh, that even the fact that he would, you know, be fact checked and people would say it's wrong, they don't care. It's just like, the American voters are, are so skeptical about everything they've, everything they've seen for so long, they just like the idea of somebody going to go in there and break things up. But, you know, he's the guy that had the balls to step into the vacuum, and that's what it took. I mean, there was a huge vacuum, there was a huge opportunity, he's the guy that showed up. Can you try to put yourself in there, inside that campaign as an advisor, and, and I mean, how would you deal with that? Well, it's, it's such an unconventional campaign, it has an unconventional structure. I mean, it's all about Donald Trump. I mean, people around his campaign don't really advise him or tell him what to do. He tells them what to do. Uh, you know, he's gone through three campaign managers. Have you talked to any of them? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and they all say that it's the Trump show. Um, he won't listen? No, I mean, part of the problem is, uh, I, you know, I know this from other campaigns, you get into this kind of mantra about whoever the candidate is, this, in this case is Trump, and the acolytes around him are saying, let Trump be Trump. What has this taught us about politics in the U.S.? Well, uh, it's taught us that campaigning today in America and, and going forward likely is different. Uh, now, the, the big question is, is this a Trump phenomenon? In other words, can somebody replicate this going forward? The anger out there isn't going away. Trump may go away. So we got to figure out how to harness that, bring people together, but there's going to be somebody else that's going to step in there and take this over, and the question is, are they going to see the light of the darkness, you know, and hopefully somebody will inspire this country rather than scare them. You worried? Sure, yeah. No, I'm as worried as I've ever been in, in my entire life working in politics. But you seem to be concerned or worried no matter who wins, it's, given that divide. Yes, I, I think there's a huge divide, there's enormous resentment, and there is a, you know, I mean, one thing that Donald Trump really tapped into was this notion that the system's rigged. And uh, the problem is that voters keep seeing evidence that that's true. I mean, just look at the last few days here with the FBI director. So they're getting all these signals that are reinforcing their worst fears that, yeah, the system is rigged. The challenge is for our leadership in this country to put in place some policies, show some behavior that suggests to people that they, they do have, still have a say in this, in this American democracy. You can catch the full interview, and there's lots more to it, with Mark McKinnon this weekend on One on One.